Okay, so we're going to continue with what we were talking about last time with respect to asynchrony. We talked about the pros and cons of synchrony. We talked about the pros and cons of asynchrony. And now we're going to start delving deeper into how asynchrony is supported in Java, beginning with the historical support that was provided by something called Java Futures. And Java Futures provide a foundation for the more powerful features that we'll be talking about as the focus of this portion of the course called Completable Futures. We'll also have a somewhat whimsical example of a human known use of Java Futures, which I always find to be pretty easy to remember and very intuitive for those of you who have ever eaten at fast food restaurants. And then we'll also talk briefly about the methods that are provided in the Java Future interface, which again provides the foundations for completable futures. So we're going to talk first about a human known use of futures, obviously not Java Futures, but futures in general. So a future is essentially a proxy that represents the results of an asynchronous call. So if you start a call that runs asynchronously, the asynchronous computation will run. And when you invoke the call, you will get back something called a future. And that future can then be used to obtain the results after the asynchronous operation completes. There's some other things you can do as well, like you can cancel it and check to see if it's done and so on. A fun example that will make it easy to remember what a future is like are the concept of table tent numbers. We've talked about these before. Back in the day, if you went to a certain kinds of restaurants and you ordered food, they would hand you a table tent number. Nowadays, they probably give you a receipt with a number on it. And this is basically a future that says, we don't give you your food right now, but we're giving you something that can be used to get your food later or redeem or claim your food. And I think I've also mentioned this before, but just for completeness, the analogy here is between the classic McDonald's way of doing fast food service, which is based on pre-cooking food and caching it in a heat lamp. You have your French fries in a heat lamp. You have your McDonald's hamburgers and a Big Macs or whatever in a heat lamp. Maybe you have a little shelf full of already pre-poured drinks and so on of different flavors of soda. And when someone goes to order the drink or order the food or the fries or whatnot, the person taking the money will synchronously take the money, turn around, get the food out of the heat lamp or off the shelf, turn around and give it back to the, to the uh, customer. And then they go on their way. So there's a synchronous transaction. The problem there, of course, is the food can get a little stale after a while. So the alternative approach, which was pioneered by other fast food restaurants like Wendy's, was to cook your food to order. And in that model, when you place your order, you want a Wendy's burger or whatever you get at Wendy's, they will not make you stand there synchronously waiting for the food to be cooked because that would take too long. It would make the revenue go down because they couldn't get people through the cash register fast enough. So instead, what they're going to do is they're going to hand you this table tent number or this receipt with a number on it. And you go off and you, you know, check your phone or you read the newspaper, if anybody reads newspapers anymore, or you uh, talk to your friends. If you talk to people anymore when you're eating, since we're not supposed to be uh, violating social distancing, whatever you're supposed to do, waiting for your food to get done. When your food is done, then either you can go back up to the pickup window and show them your coupon or your table tent number or your receipt. And if your food is ready, they will give it to you. That's what's called a polling based approach or they might come out and deliver it to you. If you go to certain places, usually delis, they'll give you like this number that sticks on top of a very large uh, kind of a steak or a post, and then they'll come by and find you and give you your food. That's the callback model. So those are two different ways to get, to redeem your futures, to get connected with the food that you ordered. So given that, given that as background, let's now go ahead and talk about the Java future API. So, Java futures were added in Java 5 or JDK 5, which added asynchronous call support via the future interface and a few other things that came along there as well, such as the executor framework, which we'll talk about very briefly. This is what the future interface looks like. As you can see, it's got five methods in it. And these methods in the future interface are used to manage an asynchronous tasks lifecycle after it's been submitted to run asynchronously. And again, it's typically submitted to run asynchronously using the Java executor framework. And there's a couple different variants there. But for the particular variant we're going to talk about here, let's assume we have a thread pool executor. In this particular case, without loss of generality, we have a fixed pool of worker threads. And so what happens is a client will come along and they will submit a task to the 
thread pool executor. There's various ways to do that. You can use things like a fixed size thread pool or a cache thread pool and so on. And then the submit submitted method, the submit method will go ahead and store the, the task onto a work queue. And then when a thread inside the thread pool is available, because they may be off doing something else at the moment, when the next thread's available, it'll come along, pull the next item off the queue, run it to completion, and then there may be some side effect or depending on what you're doing, there may be a result that's transmitted back via a future. So that's basically the workflow that's going on here. So once you invoke an operation and get back a future, so if you invoke an operation to submit a task, you get back a future. That's the thing you get back from that. You can do various things with that future. One thing you can do with the future is you can test it to see if it's finished. You can say, are you done? So you ask, is done? And if it's done, then you know you can get the result. Another thing you can do is you can check to see if the future has been canceled. And if it has been canceled, you know that you'll never get a result back. Likewise, you can also cancel it. So if it's not canceled, you could cancel it. If you don't want to wait around to get the result, you might say, gosh, I already got the result through some other means. So now that it's been canceled, I'm going to, uh, or now that I no longer need the result anymore, I'm going to go ahead and cancel it. And then, of course, the most useful thing to do with the results of a future are to get the results. So you can ask a future to get the results. And so this is a way of being able to finish up a two-way asynchronous call for a future. So you invoke an operation, it runs asynchronously, and then at some point when the time is right, you will get the results. And as you can see here, there's a couple of different ways to get the results. One way, the one that's on the top that takes no parameters, will block until the future is finished, until the asynchronous computation is done or a failure occurs. And then the second one, which is shown underneath that, that takes two parameters, will wait for up to a certain amount of time to retrieve the result. And if it doesn't get the result back in that amount of time, then it'll go ahead and return uh, an error indicating that the future was, was not able to be redeemed within the time frame. Most importantly for our later discussions, which we will start in earnest next week, is the fact that the future interface provides the foundation for the Java Completable Future class. And as you can see, Java Completable Future implements future, so it's got the methods that are defined in future as part of Completable Future, but then it defines a boatload more methods. So if there's five methods in, in future, then there's roughly 60 methods in completable future. So you can see it's quite a large, much larger number of non future methods that are part of the completable future API. Okay, so we'll talk again a lot more about completable futures here in the very near future.